Um, can I bring you in on this topic? What are your views on the grouping of lesbians, gays, bisexual, and now trans to form the LGBT? Well, I basically take the same view as Julia, which is that lesbians and gay men didn't have very much in common from the outset. Had totally different demands, totally different interests, and much more. Uh, my view, I've said this quite often in recent years, is that the whole of what Dave Chappelle calls the alphabet people uh, car has become a clown car because none of it fits together. The first two letters don't fit together very well. The lesbians and the gays don't have very much in common. Everyone's suspicious of bisexuals. Uh, um, a lot of a lot of people just don't believe they exist particularly, uh, or at least think that it's you know bi now, gay later, as they used to say. Um, then uh, then the trans people come along. They have nothing in common with any of the other people in the grouping uh, because that's about the mysterious gender unicorn nonsense, where you can suddenly be whatever sex you want to be depending on how you feel that morning when you get out of bed, which has nothing to do with being gay or being lesbian, uh, which is certainly not a choice because who wants the choice of, certainly for most of uh, p uh, history, making their life a bit harder. So the tea people come along and help turn it into a total clown car. And then you get the disaster of, it, the, of, the, of the thing extending and extending uh, until uh, you get the asexuals uh, thrown in. As I always like to say, there's no bigger difference in nature than that between between asexuals and gay men, um, the, 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 you, you get you, you you get into this two spirit people. Or what's that? It's something to do with Native Americans. Okay, what have Native Americans uh, got to do with lesbians in Brighton and London? Nothing at all. In, in other words, this has just become a great big messy soup of uh, people, uh, mainly in recent years, of people saying, I want a bit of that. I I've objected actually to it most of my life, uh, to the whole pride thing, uh, uh, mainly on taste grounds, it has to be said. Uh, I, I don't mind, I very much enjoy having a party. I, most, I don't begrudge anyone having a party. I do begrudge people mistaking their sexuality for some massively important signifier, which demands that other people then not just respect them, but pay them some special duty use. And actually, in actual fact, you could see this. So the, I, I've stumbled across Pride a couple of times in my time. I've never gone, but I've stumbled across it a few times. And one of the things that's on a simple matter of aesthetics and taste that I deeply dislike is seeing a bunch of, of disco gays on top of a bus waving to the public as if they're celebrities. Sorry, love, you're not a celebrity. You're just gay. That's all. And you shouldn't treat the general public as your audience uh, waiting for them to celebrate the magnificent, wonderful you. So I think there's just this nasty narcissism at the heart of this. Uh, uh, and uh, I've, I've got no time for it. And uh, just one other quick point. Uh, I, I actually very much, uh, Julie and I, I'm sure, disagree on lots of things. She's uh, uh, of the political left and uh, uh, I'm not. Um, and um, uh, I'm sure we disagree on lots of things. But one thing we absolutely, I think, find ourselves in agreement with on um, is that there's a new misogyny wrapped up in this movement now. And if anyone wants to see that, they can see the fact, and I, I can't stress this enough, I try to stress it wherever I go these days, that I say things about trans issues, which uh, Julie says, which JK Rowling and others say, and I get absolutely no blowback. I mean, partly I don't care anyway. But uh, the point is, is that I get no blowback. I don't get mad purple-haired maniacs gluing themselves to the floor when I speak in public. Uh, Julie Bindle gets the threats, gets these people hounding her. J.K. Rowling gets them. Kathleen Stock gets them. If anyone wants an absolute proof of this, there's a, a, a disgusting uh, um, website that is the result, the residue of a defunct gay paper called Pink News run by a pseudo-journalist called Ben something or other. They have run thousands and thousands of articles in recent years attacking J.K. Rowling, basically as the devil incarnate. She holds precisely the same views on trans that I do. She holds precisely the same views on trans as her fellow Scottish writer Irvin Welsh does. How many times has Pink News attacked Irvin Welsh? Zero. They believe, and this is a very important point if I can say so, the weird alphabet people, clown car people, 
believe that they should be allowed to control lesbians and gays and women in particular. They believe that if we don't have precisely the lockstep views they have, we are traitors. And the people that they believe they should have the right to control the most are women. They are so disgusting, these people. I, I of course, agree. The misogyny is rife. And I also haven't been on a Pride March for a very, very long time. I got sick of the roller skating nuns and I got sick. I mean, no, you know, obviously each to their own. I didn't want to see men's hairy asses hanging out of their leather chaps. I just didn't and still don't. And also I'm delighted to say that, thank you for mentioning Pink News, because I did in fact sue them mm. for defamation. Um, and we settled after 18 months of litigation where I'd love to think I handed them their ass in those chaps. But to talk about the, 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 the hellish kind of clown car, which is a great phrase, Douglas, I love that. The LGBTQQI2 spirit plus now is resembling uh, more of a, an unbreakable Wi-Fi code than it is anything that is that speaks to uh, same-sex attracted people, which is, of course, what we should be talking about. We have something in common, even though you know, one side of men and one side of women. The gender woo-woos that have come in are just absolutely bonkers. And you're right that they target women. They target lesbians in particular. They really hate really us. They target women because, of course, if you think about the clever roofs of trans activism, what it's done is it's, it's positioned me, as they would say, a cis woman, as the oppressor of a trans woman. So therefore, the oppressor class, the privileged class, whether you believe in patriarchy or not, whether you think women are oppressed, we all know that there's a disadvantage that women face in life compared to like men. And we are now the oppressor of men who identify as women. Now, Rachel Dolezal wasn't allowed to do that. Mm. Rachel Dolezal, the white woman who masqueraded uh, as having African heritage, she was not allowed. In fact, she was the biggest villain that had ever walked the earth. So why is that? And my answer is this, it's just a new men's rights movement, but this time it's populated in the main, and I'm not letting the right wing off the hook for misogyny, not at all, but it's populated in the main by men who claim to be leftists, Owen Jones, for example, who say that they're progressive. But I think, in my mind, my opinion, really hate women that are too big for our boots. Yeah. So long as they're shouting the loudest and we're in tow, they don't mind. But my God, do they hate us feminists and they give us a good kicking via the trans ideology and the the um the slur of transphobia. And I mean, you know, we've all heard um unless you've been asleep for, for four days, the latest Oxfam scandal. Another charity completely captured by Stonewall, completely captured by trans ideology dominated by privileged kids without a brain in their heads that have left university where they haven't been taught to think critically. They've been taught that thinking critically is dangerous and that they'll be punished if they do. So they then go into senior positions at charities like Oxfam. We've seen the bedrock of misogyny there. We saw that with the Haiti scandal where there were um, wealthy, highly paid consultants working for Oxfam, raping children. I will not call them sex workers. I will not say that these men were clients. They were raping children and leaving them a few quid for doing so. And Oxfam, I heard today from another whistleblower that there was a huge argument going on amongst the LGBTQQI2 Spirit Plus lot in Delhi, in India, in their office, about how these men in Haiti hadn't done anything wrong. They had simply contributed to the local economy, like going to eat at one of the local restaurants. It's staggering. No. And this this colleague, who is a lesbian, who's been called a cis bigot, who fights for the rights of women, and that means against sexual exploitation as well. She's critical of the sex industry. She was called, now wait for it, whore-phobic. Whore-phobic for saying that men shouldn't have the right to have sex, to rape vulnerable children. And she was then further told that to speak out against the sex trade was transphobic in essence, because many, and I quote, 
many trans women of colour are sex workers. So where do we go with this? Well, I mean, they literally think that they rule the roost. Yeah, that's uh, th 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 there's always a new circle that you can look down to, isn't there? And that, that that's a great example of one, Julie. Um, I, I mean, uh, groups like Oxfam have, as has been demonstrated this week, they've all just been suffused by this. This is just washed across uh, the charitable sector as is every other sector, and and it, it, it's partly because, of course. It's not just the ill education of the people that you're de describing. It's also the fact that so much of this discussion has been shut down for so long. And it's part of a wider societal issue, which is the, again, something I've talked about a lot in recent years, which is the transformation of our societies from societies wow. that, uh, uh, that admire and validate heroism into societies that admire and seek to have victimhood. And so the 2IAG, Q plus LG uh, bus people are basically a group of people who want victimhood. Well, screw that. I'm not a victim. Julie's not a victim. We're not victims. We don't live our lives as victims. Ah, but there's a certain type of, of heterosexual male in particular who wants a bit of the victimhood pie. They have the disaster, and it is a disaster in our era, to be born a white cis heterosexual male. They've got this terrifying disadvantage in the first of their life, which is that they can't claim victimhood. But now you can. Uh, there was a, a, um, a, a sort of low-grade lecturer at University of Oxford a few years ago who said that he was uh, congratulated by a student who said, it's so wonderful to see myself represented uh, um, by a tutor uh, a, a, as a queer student. The tutor in question apparently, I think, put nail polish on or something and is married to a woman. Sorry, you're not queer. You're boringly straight. You're just straight. And that's fine. You know, some of my best friends are straight. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think we should all live and let live. But this guy has realized in our era to be straight, that's not enough. So he like thinks, oh, I'll paint my nails and then I'll call myself queer. Sorry. And also for some of us, queer isn't a nice word. We didn't like you hearing that word. We didn't like hearing that word from straight people when it was hurled at gay people in the street. And we don't like it being used by straight people who want a bit of the, the sodding victimhood pie. And, right. and that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I agree. This is terrible. I'm agreeing with Douglas all the way through this. You're That's not terrible. It's absolutely normal. You're bound to say something really offensive soon. But, you know, I saw on the wonderful Hadley Friedman give an interview on Times Radio where she was talking about the absurdity of the, the Holy Month of Pride and about how, you know, Oxfam with its new LGBTQQI video in which it called middle-aged women TERFs and just full of hate, was trying to outwoke itself. And obviously spent quite a lot of money, did Oxfam, on this video and, you know, taking food out of the mouths of the children it's supposed to be helping. But she, she, she pointed this out, and she's very funny as Hadley, and she made really astute points. Instantly, little Talcum X, Owen Jones, is there saying that they now have straight people talking about pride. They have straight people denigrating our month of pride. Well, first of all, how does he know that Hadley doesn't occasionally dye her hair blue, which would make her queer? And secondly, what what is the cue, right? Are they, are they just straight men that like strangling women till they pass out? Are they straight men that are so queer they don't wash their car on a Sunday? Who are the aromantics and asexuals? In what way does that make them queer? I know lots of single people who can't be asked, can't be fagged to have a relationship, maybe not even sex. What on earth does, what, what makes them queer? Most of the queer identified people on that rainbow list are heterosexuals. Yeah. With a bit of a daft hairdo. Oh, and let's add one other to the list, which is a totally fictitious group that call themselves non-binary. Non-binary oh. means look at me. Look at me. Uh, I want attention. I'm coming out as non-binary. And they always say, oh, I've got a big announcement. I've really been, I, I mean, like, guys, like, I've been, I've been, like, waiting for ages to say something. I'm trying to build up the courage, but I'm non-binary. 
Go. Well, that's about the biggest boring announcement anyone can make. There is no satisfactory definition of non-binary that I've come across apart from look at me. And the idea that, that I mean, uh, obviously, um, uh, he, her, they, them, Sam Smith, uh, Blair, um, he uh, constantly announces that he's non-binary. And his, as Andrew Doyle said, as far as we can see, uh, uh, Sam Smith's idea of being non-binary is that he's he's a big, big fat, ugly bloke uh, who occasionally dresses like a, a hoe and uh, dances like a hoe around a pole, and that's his feminine side. Well, that's a lovely thing for all the nice. women in the world, isn't it? Isn't that just charming? Uh, um, whenever you pole dance, that's your that's you representing all the women in the world. Great work. I mean, this is this is the thing is this is old style. You know, they all think they're breaking boundaries, and they're not. They are reinforcing some of the most intolerably basic boundaries we ever had to contend with. You know, you, you, your daughter likes blue, get her on hormone therapy. You know, your son likes reading, uh-uh, girl. It's so regressive. And I remember when I first started researching the topic of transsexuality, as we used to be allowed to call it, this was back in 2003, because I'd seen some article in a newspaper about this brave and stunning um, man, male teacher that had gone back to school as a woman and that the pupils, the students were all calling him Miss Jones or whatever. And I thought, hang on a minute, is this still going on? This is seen as something really progressive and it's seen as something akin to coming out as lesbian or gay. And why, why is this? So anyway, I got on the case, ended up going to a, a store called Transformations, which was on in Houston, but there were several branches around the country. And what Transformations was, was a place where cross-dressing men who get a sexual kick from cross-dressing go to be dressed by these poor female shop assistants. They get made up. It's all online now, which is a terrible shame because I spent the day at Transformations talking to the customers, talking to the women, they found it utterly grotesque that these Sean Connery type dudes would come in and want to wear the most ridiculous outfits of, that, that they had a police woman's outfit. They had a bridal department. They had nurses' uniforms. I mean, sexual fetish or what? And, you know, size 12 stilettos. And there was a glass cabinet with all the accoutrement in there, such as a rubber vagina for men to put over their dongers so they could um, go to the loo sitting down. Now, this is the thing that upset me the most. There were some pills that they could buy over the counter that brought on, apparently, symptoms, feelings every month of premenstrual tension. That's period pain for those that don't know. Now, we spent our time as young women trying to find a cure for that. Mm. But these men want to experience it. And the sexual stereotyping and the misogyny just in that room um, was staggering. And I just thought these 1950s psychiatrists that see actual gender nonconformity, in other words, a woman like me, a man like you, we do not fit the stereotypes that were set out for men and women, the, the whole kind of Adam and Eve stuff. But... That's wrong. As you say, Douglas, that has to be corrected with the surgeon's knife. The whole, the whole project of feminism is to get rid of these rules and these stereotypes, which is what many gay men have been arguing as well. We can be as we want. We don't have to conform. Just last week, I noticed something quite interesting. Um, a couple examples, actually. You had the US Navy who decided to change their Twitter and I believe Facebook banner to support Pride. Um, but in a matter of hours, actually, they took it down, they removed it. And a similar thing happened with Major Major League Baseball, I believe. Um, what do you think is going on here? Why are companies and organizations toying with these Pride flags, which there are many variations of now, but what do you think is going on here? Well, if I can say first, I, I wrote about this a bit in a book, a couple of books back, The Madness of Crowds. Uh, you can actually trace the, the rise in this nonsense 
uh, in, into the absolute flooding across the mainstream to the post-2008 financial disaster. Um, the banks, the major corporations, people who should have been on the line for what they did to the economy and almost completely destroying the world economy, ended up discovering that a much easier way and a cheaper way uh, to improve their image after 2008 was to go very, very big on all the identity politics stuff. You know, Coots Bank, for instance, just a single one out, the Queen's Bank uh, is now covered in pride flags at the front of the, of the office and saying, a safe environment for all of our... Elderly. Uh, come on, Coots has had gays working there for years. It's not been a problem. But, but they go big on it. They go big on it after the, uh, the victories have been won. You know, uh, I'm afraid that, you know, the, um, uh, the American military wasn't great on gay rights up until yesterday. They weren't great on gay rights when I was growing up, when you couldn't be in the American military and be openly gay. Um, uh, so, so they all jump onto the bandwagon after it's actually effectively finished. And then they've, then I've, I've uh, uh, said that this is like uh, watching a train nicely pulling into its destination station and then suddenly getting ahead of steam going shooting off the tracks and off the rails. And that's effectively what's happened. The transformation of a Pride March into a Pride Day, into a Pride Week, into a Pride Month, uh, you know, as if this is an ancient and well known holiday that we all respect. When a bunch of poor straight people end up having to sort of wave rainbow flags and do things that gays don't do. Um, and, and, and it's all the cynical corporates and the great thing that has started to happen is that we, the public, are on to them. You know, uh, some years ago, I wrote in The Spectator about my bank, Barclays. Uh, you know, they had this big campaign saying, you know, love is what love uh, happens here. That was their slogan with a big rainbow. I said, I don't want love to happen at my bank. I just don't want you to charge me extra money when I lose my bank statements. Oh, and also it'd be quite nice if you gave some uh, rewards for savers. But anyway, they can't do any of that stuff that banks used to do. But apparently I can find love at Barclays in my local branch. Oh, but there aren't any branches anymore. So it makes it even harder. Anyway, the point is they can't do the basic job they were set up to do. So they do all this crap. Uh, the great thing is that we, the public, are on to them now. And that's why we've seen things like Major League Baseball start to reverse course. Because they've seen a couple of cases. We've had a big one with the Dylan Mulvaney one in the US uh, where uh, Bud Light gave this endorsement to this uh, trans look at me person and uh, the most one of the biggest attention seekers in uh, in America these days, and uh, Bud uh, Bud shares have gone down by a quarter because people have abandoned the brand. They don't like it. Uh, same thing with Target, one of the big retailers in the U.S. They've been going huge on Pride Month, including. Uh, um, swimwear for children and women that includes the opportunity to tuck your male genitalia into the swimsuit. Again, it's the women being disadvantaged. It's not happening with men's swimsuits. Uh, but Target is now also, as it were, the target of, an, of a campaign the other way. What we're really seeing is the beginnings of the backlash against this nonsense. We are. And it's money, obviously. And it's the Stonewall protection racket yeah. that means that once a company or an organization, a charity, an NGO, whoever buys into that protection racket, then they have to do all of it. Mm. And of course, because the flag has become more and more ridiculous every single year where they have added, I mean, I was torn limb from limb for saying this by some of the trans activists, the trans Taliban, but they are including the likes of maps, minor attracted persons. In other words, those that want to have sex with children. They're now seen as queer and they're seen, and we, we, we know this through academia. There are at least two or three quite senior academics who have looked at the discrimination towards those that wish to form relationships, they would say, and I would say sexually assault children, underage kids. And so they're now involved. And every time I see a new stripe, I think, what next? What now? What the hell are we looking at? And it has lost all meaning. It's lost every single bit of political emphasis that it had. And what on earth are we, are we seeing when we look at Camden Council with pink and blue, the trans flag, as a zebra crossing? I mean, you know, Kathleen Stock and I set up the Lesbian Project, which is a bit like a think tank 
to look at the way that lesbians are completely ignored uh, pretty much when it comes to the funding, when it comes to research, because we're subsumed within this atrocity of the LGBTQQI lot. And we had our first um, brilliant meeting, packed out meeting, and we were picketed, of course, by the Blue Fringe mob, dancing and singing and shouting and knocking people's phones out of their hands when they went up to them to ask what they were doing. And we finally got away from them. We'd had a great day. And there in front of us was the rainbow flag on the fl I couldn't believe it. We had to cross the road on that rainbow flag. And I just thought, it, it is the world's gone bonkers times 1,028. Of course, the flag, the flag went, went bonkers when a few years ago it was decided to add the black and the brown stripes, which was a massive category error because it was suggested that without the black and the brown stripes, black and brown people weren't represented in the flag. Well, of course, like, who did they think the yellow stripes represented or, or, or the orange ones or, or, or the red ones or the blue ones? Like, was it the Smurfs w were represented or, or like, what, what, like people from Scotland when they've been in the sun a bit too long? Like, what did they think this, the, these stripes were uh, at the beginning? They weren't about race. So that was the beginning of it. But the main thing I just like to say is, well, we wrap up is, is, is this, all of the, all of this is about a, a really appalling way to limit the way in which we see people and the way in which we see ourselves. Uh, there are no such thing as members of the LGBTQIA community. There is no such thing as that community. And when I say this, I've already explained why I think there's no such thing as that community. But there are no such thing as these people. There are people who happen to be gay, like me. There are people who happen to be straight. So what? That is the least interesting thing. It's about as interesting as the color of your hair. And what is happening is we are telling a new generation of people, apart from the fact that everyone can join the great rainbow magical unicorn people, apart from that, we're saying this will define your life. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It is the beginning of your life, not in any way the be all and end all of it. And we are making people victims. We are making them limit what they can do in their lives, what they should seek to aspire to. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is. You should simply be concentrating on doing what you should be doing in your life and doing it well. Douglas, can I, can I just ask, um, what would you say to those, what, what is your view on those people who perhaps celebrate pride or attend pride events because it gives them a sense of belonging perhaps because despite having legal equality there are still some stigma uh in society uh, and growing up can sometimes be tough and it it does provide an opportunity for people to meet one another who have shared similar experiences there's a massive number of ways you can meet other people who've had the same experiences and you can go to a gay bar you can go on any app you can meet a group of friends you can meet a wider circle of people uh, you can move to an area where there's more people like you uh, uh um all sorts of things i i, I mean the idea that uh, anything meaningful is achieved uh, from uh, the great float parade and uh, rave at the end of the day, and that, that somehow makes a community is absolute nonsense, I would say. There was a sense of community at a time in the past, as Julia refers to, when there were specific things that needed campaigning for. And there was some unity in those days, including between lesbians and gays, when, when rights were not there. But we're in the post rights struggle part of this now. And, and, and so, you know, I don't care if people want to find their meaning in a, in a great float parade and day long disco. I don't care. They're welcome to do it. What they should not have the right to do is to say, this is the only way of being gay. Uh, I had some, uh, little, um, uh, weirdo uh, 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 guy say to me on a show the other day, I was with Piers Morgan and, and this, this weirdo non-entity comedian said something, he said, uh, he described me as being straight. He said, oh, you're another cis white straight male. And I said, well, you, you've actually got that one wrong. And uh, immediately uh, he said, I was the worst type of gay. So it's quite interesting the way these people can immediately flip you from being straight to the worst type of gay. But uh, my point is, 
I don't think these people have the rights of excommunication. I don't think they have the right of representation. Stonewall is a racket. It is a racket that should have been shut down years ago. It operates like the mob. It goes to politicians and saying, nice career you've got here. Shame if anything happened to it. It does the same thing with corporations. Stonewall is a disgrace. Pink News is a disgrace. These things should be defunct. They do not speak for me. They do not speak for Julie. In fact, they attack people like us. Yes. And my point is, we do not have the situation as gays of take me to your leader. That's the worst one. The take me to your leader. Sorry, these weird malfunctioning inadequates who pretend to speak for people they don't know have no right to speak for a community they don't even understand and that doesn't in the end exist. That's what I mind. Exactly. And when I'm described as LGBTQ, I say, how dare you? First of all, how can I be all those things at once? I don't have the time. And secondly, how dare you um, call me anything other than my own definition of myself, which is first and foremost a human being, as you say, Douglas, and a lesbian. Imagine if Kathleen Stock and I decided to take a little trip down to the Pride March or one of the Pride events. We would be torn from limb. To, to, we would be absolutely vilified. We would probably be attacked. We'd be surrounded. We'd be heckled. There would be hell to pay. It would be a terrifying experience. And we are two lesbians who have fought for lesbian liberation, who have set up the Lesbian Project, and who believe in the rights of women and all human beings to exist without discrimination. But we would be under attack as though we were um, some kind of crazed evangelists coming over to try to and it all up. And it would be worse, Julie. All of this would be done to you by the people saying love is love. That's right. Love will love wins. Love wins, especially when you're beating up lesbians, apparently. <laughs> Douglas and Julie, thank you so much for joining us. 